Smarter Impact is about going beyond ourselves, our work, and our communities. It's about enabling better choices that make a difference in people's lives. And recognizing that everything is connected. To make a smarter impact, we must be knowledge-led, human-centric, and optimistic. Ready to make a smarter impact? Talk with our team or visit our website to learn how. Welcome to what we think is a story about a great suburban school district that came together in a nice history here. And I think you're gonna see that demonstrated throughout this presentation. The project is the Upper Marion Area High School and it represents a great master planning process and a process that ultimately is going to bring together that next generation of learning for the students of the King of Prussia area. And so we're in Pennsylvania and with us are a couple of great folks who will be presenting and I'm gonna let them introduce themselves uh, one note is Dan D'Amico, who served as the project manager on this project, just had a baby. And so he is going to be out for the count today. So the four that you see on the balance of the screen are the ones who will present. Doc? Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Tolino, the proud, very proud superintendent of the Upper Marion Area School District. Hi there. I'm Jonathan Bauer. I'm in my 16th year as principal of Upper Marion Area High School. So Danielle's muted. Well, that's how it starts it out really well. <laughs> so, my name is Danielle Hoffer. I'm an educational planner and senior project manager for the Schrader Group. And I'm David Schrader, and I served as the uh, principal in charge and uh, lead design and planner for the project with this great team. So we hope that through this discussion, you get a better understanding of the area in which this project is being planned. Um, then we'll go through the master planning process that led to this. Jonathan is gonna go through the academic plan and what led to the ultimate design of the building. Danielle and I will go through the planning and design process and ultimately you'll get a little sneak peek at the project which is currently under construction. So we'll start with the Upper Marion Area School District, and we'll talk just briefly about what this area represents to the suburban Philadelphia area. And I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Tolino. Great, thank you. The Upper Marion Area School District um, is a, a suburb of Philadelphia. We're approximately 20 miles from center city Philadelphia, um, just off the main line, and uh, we, are a working class community. We, we serve around 20 square miles and we have uh, a student body of approximately 4,200 uh, grades K through 12. And we also run a, a pre-K program. And you can see by this uh, photograph here that years ago, this was back in, the, in 1954, it was a very rural area, but the key to look at here is the number of highways. So we are, we are really intersected by any number of highways, which makes this an amazing community with regard to our infrastructure and what it does for us with regard to a tax base, which I'm going to talk about in a little while. Dave, next slide, please. And now you can see a more recent picture of King of Prussia and you see Route 276, you see I-76, I-422 and Route 202, which are all, 202 not so much, but 70, I-76, 276 and 422 are major highways that feed the King of Prussia area. Uh, on any given day, we have uh, approximately 50,000 people that come in and out of the King of Prussia area on any given day for work alone. So it's a very, very busy area. Um, it, it's, it's very dense in population, uh, but more importantly for us as a school district, it helps us in that we have the Valley Forge Casino. We have uh, such things as Home Depot, Lifetime Fitness. We have the King, King of Prussia Mall, which some will argue is the, the either the largest mall in the country or the second largest mall in the country. We have the development of a, of a golf course that started about five years ago um, called the KOP Town, King of Prussia Town Center, which is really um, a, a grouping of restaurants, um, uh, areas where people can relax, i.e. Uh, bars 
and then also a number of, of housing developments in, in the form of uh, stacked townhouses. So again, it's, it's an area where they've built up for people to come to and to basically stay in the area to find their entertainment, to find their food sources, and of course, to find their residential areas. So there's a lot there. We also have major biotech companies in the area. We have, we're bordered by Valley Forge Park. So we're really a, a destination place, believe it or not, for families that want to go shopping and want to do other things in the area, um, it's really fed very well into that. And, and again, as I mentioned, as a school district, this, is, this really helps us from a tax base. We have the lowest residential tax rate in all of Montgomery County. Montgomery County is one of the highest tax rated counties in the state, and it, it's certainly up there in the country as well. Next slide, please, Dave. Thank you. Um, our school and community engagement, I've been the superintendent now for five years. Uh, I'm actually in my sixth year as, as the superintendent of the school district. So I have five complete years in. And it, it's a, a township that really thrives on their school district. The, the school district itself uh, consists of um, five elementary schools, K through four, and then a middle school, which is five through eight, and then a high school, which are grades nine through 12. And really, the, we just finished two brand new projects. We added a, a new elementary school, a new K through four elementary school. And what we did was re, we replaced a K through four elementary school. So this high school piece was really the last piece we needed. And one of the reasons why we needed it is because it, it, it was a, a very, very old building. It doesn't serve our needs anymore. Um, and more importantly, from a, a school and community engagement, we are all as one. Um, and I say that not as a cliche, I say that because that's the way that works. It's such a small sending area. When I tell you that, you know, we're served by um, Upper Marion Township, i.e. King of Prussia, and then we're served by the Township of Bridgeport and West Conshohocken. So those are two very small boroughs that also serve our school district. And again, it only encompasses about 20 square miles. It's a very, very small area. So you can imagine that not only are our, our facilities used constantly, but we are constantly uh, working with the townships, uh, working with the municipal governments, working with law enforcement, working with everybody to just try to have a sense of community in the area that we serve. And it's something that we're very proud of. Um, and it, it's certainly something that we, we when, when building this new high school, uh, it, it was such an important piece to make sure that we got this done and we, we're getting it done right now. And I'm very proud of that, that it will, it will just be the last part that we need to make our, our system exactly what we want it to be. Next slide, please. As I said before, our uh, current enrollment is 4,188 students. Um, we have, we've seen a 9% increase, which is one of the reasons why we need to build a new high school. Uh, we will basically be over capacity in that high school, in, in the current high school, if we don't do something. And one of the issues that I, I noticed uh, from, the, from the day I took over as superintendent and Mr. Bauer and his staff have just done an amazing job in just being creative and, and, and allowing our staff and students, we're very proud of the fact that we allow our staff and students to, to try things and, and, and in, in some cases fail um, because we really believe that it's something that we need to allow our students to do, we need our, our staff members to do, but more importantly, when, you, when I walked into our high school the first time, I noticed that um, there were kids everywhere, in hallways, um, in vestibules, just sort of you know, doing their thing. They were, they were working collaboratively with one another. Um, they had their laptops. We are a full one-to-one -one district, K through 12. We're very proud of that. And we noticed that, I, I noticed that that was something that I hadn't seen before. You know, I've been doing this job for a long time but this is the first time where I've really seen the flexibility where staff members foster that and a building principal and building administration foster that kind of activity amongst our students and our staff members. We even have students that take their lunches up to the library, believe it or not, and that's going to be unheard of in many places, but they take their lunches up to the library so they can collaborate with not only the library staff, but also other students as well. So when we started looking at at the increases in, in projection and the things that were gonna happen, we really knew that we needed to look at this new building as a way to, to really foster that, foster what we've created and what Mr. Bauer and his staff has created and the staff members have created to really make this thing all fit because 
the one thing that we didn't have and that we were very concerned about after looking at, at, the, at the high school, the existing high school when I first got there was the high school was determining what we could offer. And you never want to be in that situation. It's like being upside down in a car loan. You know, you just can't quite get out of it. And the bottom line was, if the Board of Education had told me six years ago, hey, we want to add this, this, and this, I would have said, well, what are you going to give up to do it because we don't have the space? And that's truly a problem. That, that clearly is an issue uh, for any um, educational leader. You never want to be in that situation. So that really fed into what we wanted to do as far as the design characteristics of the high school are concerned. Next slide, please, Dave. Uh, we are a very diverse district, as this shows. Um, we have any number of, of gifted students. We have low-income students, uh, English as second language students. So, you know, and clearly we have our students with our IEPs. So, you know, we're, we, we cover the gamut of all students, and we really believe that we do an amazing job in everything that we do, and we're very proud of what we do. And again, we really believe that this new building is going to be something that's going to help us take that even to the next level. Next slide, please, Dave. We have an operating budget of $110 million. Um, our real estate tax is $90 million. And our tax base, and this is very, very, this is great for us because um, we have a 42% residential rate and a 58% commercial rate. Now, the beautiful part of that is that, as I mentioned before, our residential rate is the lowest in Montgomery County. And so what we don't get is we don't get um, those groups of people coming in to to fight us when we wanna do things in the district. So we're very, very fortunate. But the other side of that is when you get a lot of your money from commercial and industrial properties, you do stand the chance when the um, economy begins to go down, you, you are looking at things for assess, you are looking at potential assessment appeals, which could hurt our bottom line. But we've done a great job over the years in making sure that we protect against that. So we, we also feel like we're, we're in really good shape as far as all those things are concerned, but that all feeds into what we're trying to do and to be able to provide, you know, this next level of learning through this facility for our community that we serve. Next slide, please, Dave. Um, our expenditures, as you can see here, it's pretty much self-explanatory. Uh, this really doesn't change from many districts. You know, there, it, this is all pretty much the same. You're all going, you're all spending your money on on salaries and benefits. Um, you know, we have a lower debt ratio than most school districts would have or than a lot of school districts would have, especially that are in our situation where we just added two new buildings. Um, so again, we're, we are very conservative in our budgeting. We tend to always be conservative when it comes to numbers. Um, and we started phasing in a financial plan for this building just about six years ago before we even started the design aspects of this building. We started a financial plan to make sure that we would be in a position right now to, to be able to pay for this building and to be able to be in a good solid financial position to not have to put a, that much burden on our taxpayers going forward. Next slide, please, Dave. So I, I talked about things that we strive to do and, and, and these are things that, these are quotes that uh, Dave had asked me to put together and we strive to engage students and teachers in the most collaborative process and hence and, and require spaces allowing collaboration. I talked about collaboration before, and it's interesting when you see students sitting anywhere in your high school uh, at any given period, and the engagement is there by, by not only our building leadership, but also by our teachers. But yet we wanted to create spaces that are now gonna be appropriate for students to meet in. And you're gonna see a lot of those spaces. I don't wanna give those things up right now because I think it's, it's something that, that Dave and Danny should talk about. Um, and of course, Mr. Bauer should talk about later on because it's just, it, they're gonna be incredible spaces. So we're proud of that. Dave, please. Um, we don't also never wanna limit learning. You know, we wanna make sure that, you know, all learning is possible within our buildings uh, in anything that we do. Uh, the two new elementary schools re reflect that as well. We've retrofitted our existing fleet of elementary schools as well, just to make sure that students can learn the second they walk on our campus. We just don't want students to feel like they're gonna learn or can learn when they walk into a classroom. We want our students to learn the second they come onto our campus, no matter what it is, whether it's uh, outdoor classrooms that we have, uh, whether it's the ability for our staff members to be flexible and take students outside, whether it's anywhere in any of the buildings that we have, we want, it, we want our students to feel like, okay, learning can take place, whether it's a cafeteria, it doesn't matter where it is, that's, that's very, very important to us. Next slide, please, Dave. 
We desire, we desire a facility that provides state-of-the-art spaces for our student athletes and student performers. Well, one of the issues that you might have noticed on the first slide, and I, I'm not sure I did a great job pointing it out, we are landlocked. Um, you know, typically, if you ask a designer or an architect um, what kind of acreage a high school should be built on, including all the fields and stadiums and every, all the support you need for a typical high school, they're going to tell you anywhere from 50 to 75 to 100 acres. Well, in our case, we have 52 acres total that we already have a middle school sitting on and a stadium field and our existing high school. So we're landlocked. So we had to look at our facilities in such a way to say, okay, what do we do? How do we make the best use of this property we have? We can't buy property. There's no property to be bought in the King of Prussia area. So moving the high school was out of the question. So we're in a situation where we are building a brand new high school, but in the meantime, we're taking up all of our practice fields and our game fields. The only thing we do have left is a stadium field that we turfed uh, two or three years ago, right, Jonathan, about two or three years ago. It should be our third season on the turf field. So we had to do that first in order to make this project possible because we knew that we wouldn't have fields left. And so we're very limited where we can go for practices right now and, and, and throughout the time that we're going to be building this high school, we're going to make it work. So it was very important that all of our facilities provided spaces for our athletes and our community members to perform. And so we're going to have a series of spaces, which you'll see later, that our baseball, our softball, and our two auxiliary flat fields, i.e. Uh, soccer, field hockey, um, and lacrosse are all going to be turfed because we have no choice. And the reason is because one of the reasons is because we're worried about regeneration of grass. And we're also concerned that our community, i.e. the youth programs use our fields so much that we were just concerned that we would never get the fields back as far if they were grass. So we decided to go all turf. So we also needed places where we can provide uh, swimming for our students. We currently have two pools. We have one in our middle school. We have one in our, in our high school. Both of them are obsolete. So we're going to be, and needless to say, the community uses our pools a lot. Uh, it, it's incredible how much they're used. So we needed to put in a new pool in and to make sure that our student athletes can thrive, but also the younger student athletes that are going to be feeding the upper Marion area school district can also thrive and can also be proud of the facilities they're going to have so that they know when they get up to the high school level, these are the facilities they're going to share in. And that's something that we're very proud of. And again, I'm not going to steal the thunder of the design team, but uh, they just did an amazing job. And, and I know they're going to show you some of those things later on. Next slide, please, Dave. Uh, as I mentioned before, I kind of got ahead of myself. We had no property to purchase. So we were stuck. We were stuck on a, about a 52 acre lot that already, con already consisted of a, a stadium field, a full stadium, and also a middle school that houses approximately 1,100 students. So what we're trying to do with this high school is to fit it in a place, build a new high school, take the old high school down, and then recreate where the old high school is into the fields that I mentioned before. So we are landlocked uh, on all sides and we are literally right in the middle of a neighborhood. So we've even received from the first day, we received complaints of dump trucks coming in. So we're dealing with all of those things. Uh, there's, there's nothing rural about where we're trying to build this building. But the bottom line is that it's, an, it's going to be an absolutely stunning building and it's going to serve our community and our students for years to come. Next slide, please, Dave. Um, we also wanted a facility that's going to be welcoming and, you know, that has everything since our community uses our playing fields, the pool, the gymnasiums, the performance spaces. We wanted to make sure that we provided all that. We currently have an old stage, but yet we have such an active uh, we have an old theater in our high school, like, like most districts do that have older buildings, but we have such an active program and that's such an important piece to us. The arts are so important and, and athletics are so important, but also the academics are so important. So we, we just, we put so much emphasis on all of it that we needed to design facilities that are gonna serve all of those needs. And again, without stealing thunder, I know that you're gonna see some spaces later that you're gonna be, that we are, are just so very, very proud of and we can't wait to get this building open again, to better serve the needs of our students and our communities and our staff members. Um, we also, what was very important to us as well is branding. You know, when, when we met with students and we met with staff members through this design process, you know, it's interesting how the students come up with these things and they, they were looking for 
you know, I held a lunch uh, in my office with Mr. Bauer and with one of, with, at the time, our board president. And we talked, we, we brought in uh, some 11th and 12th grade students and we talked about what they would be looking for. And it was interesting how most of the things they talked about was the branding of their school, that they're very proud of, of what we call the Viking nation. Our logo is the Viking and the colors that we have. But they also were very concerned that, that we, we, put a, we put branding into this. Like they, they even mentioned flags on, on the light poles that are going to be coming onto our property and, and, and actually on, in our parking lots. They talked about, you know, anytime we use colors in the building, let's make sure that we use the colors that we use as a school district. So we listened to all of those things. And um, we're, we're, again, very excited that, that it's, this building is not going to have any colors that don't go along with what we're doing as a district. And our branding is going to be all based on, on anything having to do with our school district. So that was something that was important to the community. It was certainly important to our student body. And those are things that we've achieved. And you're going to see some of those things in a little while. Thank you, Dr. Delano. So welcome. that's a great history and uh, a great buildup for everything that we were um, and I, I want to say challenged with and yet not challenged with because this whole thing has just been an exciting experience for everybody involved. And I think you'll, you'll hear the same enthusiasm from everybody. I wanted to back up about six or seven years and start with where this all came from. And the 2014, uh, we were actually brought on by the district to begin a master planning study. And this was after the district had built three new elementary schools. And so they already had the good fortune of three new elementary schools and a beautiful middle school that was built fairly recently to that as well. So we worked through probably about a year worth of community input, uh, very large community gatherings for the master planning, and then ultimately a series of board decisions through 2015 that led to the two elementary schools that Dr. Tolino referenced just now. So in 2016 and 2017, we worked our way through the design and permitting process and ultimately to the construction of those two buildings in 2018. So those were the start. And as with anything that we try to do in Association for Learning Environments, a community-based process was exactly what we used. Uh, we worked through a very large group of people with all of these parameters that Dr. Tolino talked about. So you've seen the district boundaries, you understand the, uh, the density of the school district. Interestingly, in that image of the school district right there, the upper left-hand corner is actually Valley Forge Park. So the only true green space in that district uh, of any uh, substance is really a national park. So that's a pretty interesting part of this. And again, we walked into this with three new elementaries, Candlebrook Elementary, uh, Bridgeport, and Roberts Elementary, all brand new buildings or reasonably new buildings. And, and same with the Upper Marion Middle School. As with many districts that you work with, um, you had catchments for those buildings that were starting to spread and that had uh, certainly demographic challenges. And so through the master planning process, we uh, came up with a series of options as, as many of you do. And ultimately this worked itself back to a new K to four structure from the original K to five. Um, maintaining though that middle school concept of five to eight. So we just kept it the K to four. And I guess I should have said it was K to four. And there was a thought that if you ever needed to, you could expand to the K to five if you needed to allow for some expansion within the middle school. But the district is doing great with the uh, K to four structure. And so the middle school has maintained itself. The catchment area though, for those buildings, once the new ones were built, Gulf and Cayley, uh, was to expand the additional building and to allow for a little bit more even spread of catchment for the different buildings. And again, through that process, and you'll see Danielle is gonna talk a little bit about kinds of things that we do with changing learning styles and so many of you are doing. Uh, we do recognize that goal of traditional instruction, but also the research, investigate, make, develop, present and report out, and then the community and internal community use of buildings as Dr. Polino was talking about. And of course that leads to different space types. We try to define that through some of the other buildings that we've done before, and ultimately in the spaces that are defined by that. And these are just a series of those other spaces that, that work their way into the design process as you start to work through uh, ultimately what will become that building. 
in all of these projects, and Danielle's gonna go through this for the high school, we certainly start with the tours and work through visioning and planning workshops, design workshops, and in this case, it was for the elementary schools, and then ultimately that celebration. And so, again, through the process and before we got to the high school, here are a series of design workshops that we led, and you can see every generation represented and these are always fun because you get to see what the students come up with, which is sometimes the most interesting thing. So again, these kids were working towards the elementaries that we talked about at that point. And ultimately, you can see in the upper left-hand corner, it may be tall, but it is that child's dream school. So that's a pretty cool comment. And I'm going to go quickly through this because we really want to talk about the high school project, but you can see how we diagrammed uh, the elementaries from an academic clustering from a social structure to the various learning styles that work their way through that building and into ultimately a layout of uh, diagramming for the building that works its way into the floor plans. And so we made uh, two prototype buildings here in the district between Cali and uh, Gulf Elementary Schools. And the only difference was that that classroom wing that you see in the upper right-hand corner flipped depending on the site and depending on the topography. So STEAM uh, organization is at the front of the building, the academics are at the back, the left-hand or lower left-hand side are all the community spaces. And these are the new buildings that Dr. Tolino was able to christen two years ago. Uh, the one that you're seeing here is the Gulf Elementary School. You're seeing the STEAM spaces in the front. And on the left-hand side here are all of the community spaces. Um, very great social structures within the buildings. And the core of these are the learning resource centers, which you'll see as a concept carrying through, of course, into the high school. Uh, great dining uh, and gymnasium spaces with stages that can turn both ways. And then ultimately that central learning resource and STEAM center at the center of the buildings. And this just happens to be the actual STEAM classroom that goes along with that media center structure. And then the typical classroom with the breakout areas in the back. One of the things that, that Doc uh, mentioned was the concept of making sure that the Viking Nation stays as part of this whole uh, concept and that all of the branding works its way through. Uh, this happens to be one of the mural art walls within the building. And uh, one of our graphic designers worked with the school district to come up with a reinterpretation of Upper Marionary School District, Norristown, King of Prussia, and uh, the whole area. And you can kind of see it in a very cartoony format there. So that led to the high school. And uh, Jonathan Bauer now is gonna share with you what concepts came up as part of this planning process. And then Danielle will go through after that, how we took the team through this entire process. So Jonathan, it's all yours. All right, thank you, David. Uh, yeah, so, so right off the bat, we were tasked with uh, who are we as a school? Uh, what do we believe uh, you know, about our current academic program? And what do we see as the future of Upper Marion? So the first picture there you see is Upper Marion's past. Uh, there's a, a, a picture of our building from the 60s. The uh, building was built in 1960. And, uh, and it's really not much different today. You'll see in the next picture, uh, the next slide, this is uh, our current layout. And although that building from the 60s was renovated at some point in the 90s, uh, and you could see a baseball field turned into tennis courts and some other things, but for the most part, the bones and structure of that building from 1960 are still what we're uh, using today to, to help kids teach, uh, help teachers teach and help kids learn. So uh, we have some constraints with our current building. Uh, in the next slide, you'll see some of the pictures that kind of highlight maybe some of those constraints uh, that we'll talk about later as our educational priorities. But we have a beautiful library, uh, but it's it's kind of a closed off space. It's certainly not not open. Uh, I took a picture of the entrance because it's sort of a throughway there uh, in the middle of a hallway. And and unless you're in the library, you can't see the library resources. You know, they're not really uh, they're not as accessible as you think you you might want them to be. Uh, when we talk about collaboration, uh, there's a picture of some tables where kids collaborate in our library currently, uh, and we really wanted to take that up to a whole new level uh, in, in the new building. You also see some classrooms with some books along the way. Uh, we'll talk about our literacy initiative to sort of decentralize our library and get uh, classroom sets of, of 
library books in classrooms, uh, but we do that with a variety of bookcases and uh, shelving and, and things of that nature, where we're, we're looking forward to you know, designing a classroom that's built to house a classroom library. And then finally, you see uh, some of our uh, other uh, physical education, athletic spaces. And uh, you know, those are uh, you know, just not to par with what we see uh, in the county. And that makes a difference for us in our physical education curriculum. And it makes a dis difference for us extracurricularly. And then the final thing you might see, there are a couple of those outside pictures those are areas outside our STEM areas, outside our art room, outside our technology and engineering makerspace. So when kids wanna do some work uh, outside of the classroom or outside of the building, we, we don't have ideal spaces to do. We have some space, but they're certainly less than ideal. Uh, and some of our classrooms, uh, that, that classroom picture there, you can see we have two teacher desks. So there's, there's a, uh, an idea that we want to really maximize the square footage in our building to be student-centered, uh, less less teacher centered and some of that came through in the design. So as we, as we had to think about who we are as a building, we thought about our priorities. Uh, and the first of those uh, that you'll see on the next slide is uh, our laptop program. So we were one of the first one-to-one uh, -one laptop programs. We were on the leading uh, wave of that in the state of Pennsylvania and we were the first high school in our county. Uh, so we've done it for quite some time now. And uh, those schools that have done that, what you, what you realize right away is it changes your school environment completely. That idea of anytime, anywhere learning really comes to life. Uh, what Dr. Tolino talked about, kids learning in stair stairwells and hallways uh, is a common occurrence. You almost cannot walk down one of our hallways when, when kids are in session and, and not find a student somewhere uh, or a group of students, honestly, somewhere uh, sitting on the floor with a laptop because our, our building wasn't designed for kids to learn outside the classroom. You know, we're traditional narrow hallways uh, and the space for learning is, is inside the classroom. What we found out with when you get into, uh, you give a laptop, put a laptop in a kid's hand and they're not tied uh, to a computer lab or a specific area to learn. What you find is that they learn all over the place and in many different places. So this new design has learning stairs that you'll see uh, some really exciting collaboration spaces outside the classrooms, and then a transparency between what's happening in the classroom and what's happening in those common areas. We wanted a lot of glass so that you could see, you know, a teacher sends kids out into the hallway to, to learn and collaborate, uh, but they're not cut off from what's happening in the classroom. We also, we wanted some, some of those outside of the building spaces, not just common areas just outside the classrooms, but places to learn outside uh, to be exciting and functional. Uh, that also uh, led into our next priority where you really see uh, a decentralization of the library and, and your research opportunities. So, you know, our library has changed over the years. We've got less and less stacks. And for those of you that works in, work in schools, all of you are experienced the same thing. You've got less stacks and rows of books than you ever had before. And you have to decide, well, what, what do we need to do with that additional space. So we've made changes in our library uh, that have helped uh, with collaboration of students, but this was an opportunity to redesign it completely uh, and to take that closed off space as beautiful as it might be and to say, I really want that open. And I want that to be something where kids are, are naturally walking through it. And then we also want just beautiful collaboration spaces because now, as opposed to uh, maybe at the beginning of my career, when kids went to the library, and they tried to get a computer station because they had to do some research. Now they're going to the library to collaborate with other kids. They don't need the computer, they're bringing that with them. The research is, is in their fingertips, but it's a meeting space where they can collaborate with other kids. So we put some really cool collaboration spaces in our library uh, in the design. In the next priority, uh, we talk about uh, not only, you know, do kids collaborate quite a bit in our building, but teachers do as well. And, and I'll uh, venture to say that teachers collaborate more than they ever have. Just that's part of uh, education today. And our school's no different than everybody else. Professional learning communities. Uh, we have course collaboration groups. We wanna make sure that there's common assessments, common curriculum, and you need people to come out of their individual classrooms and be willing to work together and, and have that uh, you know, sustained collaboration over long periods of time. So again, if, if it's isolated classroom spaces, then we sort of have to work against that to get people together to collaborate. Uh, 
but if we can, again, change the classroom atmosphere to be more student-centered, then we can take the instructional planning centers that are gonna be available to teachers and make those teacher-centered and focused on collaboration. So we're excited about those opportunities that are gonna happen uh, naturally now, as opposed to maybe, maybe forced, uh, because just proximity to one another and the space to collaborate. In our uh, next slide, we talk about uh, that idea again of student-centered. So if we take out, you know, one thing we say right now in my building, the only place that we give a teacher to live their professional life is in their classroom. So each of them take a decent amount of square footage in the corner of that classroom. You've all seen classrooms like this, where there's the teacher desk and uh, maybe a computer desk and a filing cabinet. And it takes up quite, amount, quite a, you know, a decent amount of room in the classroom because that's where, they, that's where they get to live their professional life. If we give them another exciting place to do that in an instructional planning center, we can open up that classroom to a much more flexible and dynamic instructional space uh, no teacher desk necessarily, more of a teacher podium to present from, uh, a teacher workspace, but to make sure that everything is fluid and, and uh, is able to change based on what we're teaching, why we're teaching it, how much we want kids to collaborate, how much we want kids to do independently. Uh, so we want to we want to take those classroom spaces and use every square inch of square footage that we can uh, to make sure that it's student centered. That's in our traditional classrooms. And of course, in our STEAM areas, uh, we want those students centered as well. I, I showed you some of our outdoor team uh, STEAM spaces and uh, this, this new building really takes that to a whole new level where the art and the uh, technology and engineering and the maker space, that's all on our ground level that has immediate access right from the classroom out to outdoor learning areas where they really can, can grow and explore um, we're just we're just incredibly excited about that opportunity. So uh, I think our STEAM opportunities uh, are just gonna just gonna grow by leaps and bounds just by the just by the sheer facility that we're gonna get them to to do the work in. Uh, next, I showed you the, the picture if you recall of like you know books all over the classroom. So uh, our English department has done an amazing job of really taking on uh, classroom libraries, and it's improved the amount of reading that our kids do uh, immensely. And that's not something that uh, took place in our school before. That's not something anybody who developed a school in 1960 uh, thought of as they designed a school, that kids wouldn't go to the library to get a book, but they would be right on hand and, and each of our English classrooms would have classroom libraries. So that's just an that's just a, a example of something we're trying to retrofit an old building to do, but when we have the opportunity to create and say, okay, the future of uh, the, our, actually our current and future of reading is not going somewhere else to read, but if kids have it right within hand. And so we developed some casework that's inside each of those classrooms so that they'll, they'll have uh, you know, books of their own choice to grab from. And as well in the common areas, we put some casework out there because we just want you know, that feeling of books, books everywhere. And you know, be a reader, go to a comfortable spot, and have a book near at hand that you can grab uh, and read. And you also saw some of our physical education areas. And frankly, right now, uh, they're just uh, not up to speed with you know, other schools in our area. And uh, this, this new opportunity for us was to say, if we value our athletic programs, if we value our physical education curriculum, then we really need to have a space that shows that. And where we have, we're spread out. Some of the picture that you saw from 1960, uh, some of the things that were added on were, you know, an additional gym and things like that. Uh, the, the weight room has changed from where it was originally in the building to where it is now. When you change things around like that, you get away, I guess, from the original design of, you know, where they were meant to be and how they function with one another. Uh, so we're excited about uh, the large uh, main gymnasium that we're going to have that can divide into three instructional spaces that has a second floor indoor track uh, where kids can do a lot of, uh, of walking and running, uh, various other track activities as well. Uh, and then a life fitness studio and an athletic strength, strength training studio that are going to work hand in hand with one another, both curricularly and for our athletes. So we're extremely excited about that. 
Uh, and then the final priority that I'll talk about is special education. We've had an increasing population over the years of students with special needs. Uh, we have a high level of uh, students with autism. We have students that need life skills training. And the, the traditional classrooms that we have for those, again, we've made the best, uh, we're proud of our program, uh, but the facility, we're not necessarily pr proud of the facility that we get to do our program in. And this uh, absolutely changes that dynamic completely. Uh, not only are there academic classrooms built in for our life skills suite, but there's a fully functional apartment. There's a job training workroom that's gonna be directly connected to the student's store. It's all nearby to the cafeteria and those commons areas. So those kids uh, are gonna you know, be front and center in our building because that's an important program to us. And, uh, and I'm excited to, to see how we can get and really when it's an important program, it should be front and center of your building because it's sort of, and in the new design, it's, it's at the heart of everything and what we do. So that's, that's one of the exciting pieces. So those are just some of the priorities that we worked off of, some of the spaces that we're excited about. And, uh, and you'll see further in the presentation, you'll get a glimpse of what some of those spaces turned out to be. So following all that, you've seen the enthusiasm expressed through the community uh, by Dr. Tolino. You've seen the enthusiasm of the building and the thoughts behind what the building are and how it's being carried forth today by Jonathan Bauer. Um, we had to build a vocabulary of thinking for everybody so that they could start to frame some of these ideas in ultimately a construction of a, a concept here. And so Danielle's gonna lead you through a little bit of the team uh, that we built, the tours, and then I'll get into a little bit of the scheming. Again, I had to unmute. Um, so what an amazing opportunity this was for everybody involved. Um, Jonathan's been operating his school in a 60-year-old building. You don't have a lot of opportunities to build a new high school. Um, so we really wanted to involve the constituents, local constituents, and key stakeholders as part of this process. Um, not only were the design team included the administration and the, and the staff and the faculty, but we also brought in um, the students who helped us with the STEAM design. We looked at, we brought in community members who were interested in seeing how the kids would be educated in the school and how that would translate to the, the corporate community. Um, and they were very excited about the building. So uh, as we, before we even started this process, you know, a lot of times teachers don't know what they know, only know what they know and what they know is what they're living in now. So going in and touring buildings is a great opportunity for people to talk to their peers, talk to the people that are using the building, getting an understanding of what's out there, what they like and what they don't like about the building and really kind of kick the tires and get an idea of um, what they would like to see in the design of the new school. So we went on a series of tours. You can see this particular tour, we involved um, the board members, that's me, I am not um, texting anybody. I'm actually writing down on my phone some of the comments that were being made. Uh, Dr. Tolino's there, the construction manager. Um, so this was a great opportunity to see what's out there. Um, and if you move to the next slide, we all had some kind of understanding of some of the local um, high schools in the area. Um, within a three, mile, three hour radius, there was three high schools that we identified, Central York, um, State College Area High School, as well as Strasbury Area High School. Um, each of them had their own identity of things that we wanted to look at, but David, with them, his experience with A4LE, reached out to his peers and asked five of his um, com comrades uh, what schools they thought we should tour anywhere in the United States. So looking at five different regions of the United States, he asked them to list five different high schools that they would recommend. And each one of them recommended going to Alexandria Area High School in Alexandria, Minnesota. So the design team and uh, staff and the superintendent and the principal packed up our bags and we went to Minnesota around this time of year. So we're starting to get cold. Um, this particular site is in a more rural area, but if we get into the context of the building, what we were immediately struck with when we walked into this space, and this is the student commons area, is just the energy that 
um, this space embodied. It was the central core of the building. Um, as we passed through this space throughout the day during our tour, it was actively, um, people that were actively involved in it. Students were in there all the time. This is actually during the cafeteria time frame. You can see the cafeteria in the back there. But surrounding it are all the glass rooms that open up into the space, um, the uh, guidance area, some of the tech ed spaces, the, alert, the stair going up, so there's that vertical circulation part. It was just a really vibrant space and just a great entry into the building just to see how the students are interacting with everybody. In the academic wing, these learning stairs will go from floor to floor, um, which was uh, Great to see the kids working and interacting together. They're surrounded around the perimeter there. You can see there's glass walls. Those are actually glass mountable walls. And we immediately thought, wait a minute, there's gonna be such a distraction um, with people walking through there and the kids working in these spaces and working around in these open areas. And much to our surprise, kids didn't even care. <laughs> they just kept them on, kept with their work. They didn't even notice that a bunch of suit and ties were walking through the spaces. and. So that was really interesting to see because we, unlike the high school is now, just getting that um, transparency between the workspaces and the, and the collaboration areas. This is a, a photo of the um, cafeteria, uh, scattered kitchen type of thing. Again, open to that student commons area. Um, kids can use it throughout the day. It's not just shut down, it's operational during lunch period, but they can use it throughout the day, get coffee. So that was Alexandria. Um, then we went on to um, um, the next location, which was state, uh, Central York. And again, this had some great um, examples of athletic facilities. As you'll see in the next slide, there's a elevated track going around um, a three station gym down below. And then the next slide is uh, uh, their pool area and you can see the elevated uh, seating area above there, which was of interest. It has a bulkhead, so you can have the diving well as well as the swimming area going on at the same time. We also went to State College. This is an actually an old photograph um, that we had when we were going through the tours. The buildings that you see around that kind of dirt area was the area um, that they were preparing the slab for the new addition onto the building. But one of the points of interest in this particular school was looking at the um, commons area, the media, the media center and commons area, with the, which is enhanced with technology and various learning spaces. This is a teaming area that's got technology for student activities and uh, open to the corridor. And then the final um, photograph is an outdoor learning space, which was of interest to um, just try to get that outdoor and indoor activity and connectivity um, between the two spaces. And finally, we went to East Stroudsburg Area High School, um, looked at several spaces there and points of interest, as you see in the next slide, is the science um, labs. We also looked at a lot of the physical education spaces, such as the gymnasium shown here, um, the fitness room, and finally, looking at the auditorium, some of the specifics associated with that. So I'm gonna turn it over to David to just talk a little bit about some of these learning styles and how we incorporate it. And we'll get into how we incorporated that into the building design. Sure, and just a clarification, the last one was actually Stroudsburg. What did I say? Stroudsburg. East, not a big oh. deal. So, um, Credit to all of the uh, prior firms who worked on all of those projects. Uh, they're all recognized on each of the slides and we all learn from each other. So everything that Jonathan and Dr. Tolino have talked about is represented by the learning type and space type representation in these documents. And going back to Cunningham Group's uh, beautiful facility in Alexandria, a lot of these ideas became kind of central points to, to the vocabulary that we wanted to use for this project. So now we'll bring you to the project and I'm gonna turn the uh, orientation of the site a couple of times. Uh, this particular setting is a little bit more east-west and you can see in the left-hand side of this, the existing high school that Jonathan brought you through. And you can see the middle school on the right-hand side of the site with the track and stadium uh, directly adjacent to it. 
But what's more interesting about the site is its connectivity to uh, some of the other community resources right in this area. So there are, there are parks in red that are to the left and then a community center to the right. Uh, one of the elementary schools happens to be within two blocks of the building. And then right on the right is the, well, at least not in this photograph, but eventually became the new Cali Elementary School. So uh, a lot of resources for the community in that very condensed area. So we went through a whole series of options. And as you do, when you do your planning, uh, there are a series of things that you want to try to identify. Uh, you also want to try to, if possible, work with the existing building. And so this concept represented working with the existing high school and uh, trying to build or at least maintain just the gym and the pool area from that, building a new uh, high school adjacent to the existing one and eventually taking the old one down. We had done that for a series of middle schools in a district just south of the school district, and it was one that we wanted to consider. Uh, we also played with the idea of maintaining one of the newer classroom wings, uh, one of the auditorium or the auditorium, and then those gyms that we talked about. And to try to condense some of the property area here, we, we talked about the idea of a parking deck to try to pick up some of the parking that we needed uh, with a playing field on top of it. So that's what this represents. Each of these represent uh, or show a line that cuts through the baseball field and the playing field. You can just see it kind of running between two blue areas. This became a primary topic for us because it's an underground stream, underground water course uh, that we had to somehow work around. So you can begin to see how some of the site parameters make this very difficult. Another concept was reusing the gymnasium and the pool, uh, building a parking deck at the backside and doing all new academic wings off to the top. And then uh, all of those condensed functions to the right hand side still maintaining the existing property site. Then we started to kind of break out of that box and talk about different locations on the site for a brand new building. Again, obviously all trying to deal with uh, avoiding that underground water course, uh, maintaining the functionality of the existing middle school. And once the old building, once the new building is built, the old building gets torn down and playing fields uh, go into its place. So you can see two locations for the high school here between option four and option five. And then option six starts to cross that stream, which as we began to work with the uh, engineers on the permitting process, it became pretty clear that that's a very difficult thing to do to the extent that we're showing it in this document. And that's how we landed in, in what ultimately became the concept. Um, option seven is the beginning of the, the concept and you're seeing a connection between the middle school and high school because there was that thought that at some point, this is a secondary campus. And instead of offering grade structures, perhaps you're offering different courses and you, you move through that building based upon the course structure that you require. What this did was this started to meld the uh, uh, athletic areas of both buildings together. So you ended up with one central athletic complex between the two buildings that you could still breakdown so that one was truly high school, one was middle school, but there's the opportunity to share the two. And that became the diagram that we started to work with. And so as you look at that diagram, you'll start to see some of that common central core uh, that you saw from the Alexandria building. And then we begin to work the academics and tried to figure out where that steam function fell in the whole building. So you rotate the site about 90 degrees and you start to see all those functions working. And one of the things that we began to work with as we worked with the County Conservation District was trying to find a way to work with the stream that bisected the site and figure out a way to try to use that in kind of a different way. So what you'll end up seeing in the concept ultimately is that media commons area at the central core of the building, the athletics and performing arts on the one side, the academics on the other, and all of the outdoor learning spaces get built around this concept of that, that uh, covered stream, or as it's currently covered, opening. The County Conservation District likes to see you expose waterways that have been covered as much as you can. And we took that as an advantage to the project and turned that into the outdoor learning area. So after all of that, the master planning, the conceptualizing, the thought process behind it, and ultimately the process that we went through for 
probably almost uh, the better part of two years between the early planning and the final concept planning, we started to work with the actual project. This is a little bit better diagram of that concept that I showed you before of all the connected parts. So again, we have Cali Elementary School at the top of this, we have the Upper Marion Community Center, which connects through a, tra a trail structure right through our property and brings all of these complexes together. And there's a connection between Candlebrook Elementary and the Upper Marion uh, Area High School as well, because actually some of the students currently park in the parking lot of Candlebrook and walk. Uh, further, the Upper Marion Township Library in the lower left-hand corner is also where the Upper Marion Township is, where they have their police station, where they have their township building, and so on. So there's a lot of connectivity between this site and the community and right on this site. This was the ultimate concept. And the white that you're seeing is the middle school, and then the salmon color is the, uh, the central portions of the high school building. The middle school is a three-story academic structure. And so it made sense for us to construct a three-story academic structure for the high school as well. And then you see the balance of all of these uh, playing fields that get built once the existing high school is finished. And then of course, trying to figure out a way to work in the parent drop-off, which is such a major element on any high school site and the bus drop-off. And so the bus drop-off is on the right-hand side here uh, and actually faces the front of the building. And the parent drop-off comes around to the back side of the building and connects to both the middle school and the high school. Probably less important for the moment are the floor plans. You'll start to see these and actually experience them in 3D. But you can see the athletic complex, the performing arts complex on the right-hand side. You can also see a conversion of the old um, middle school uh, swimming pool into another part of the athletic complex for both the high school and the middle school. So we're actually filling that in as Dr. Colino talked about and turning that into another recreation space. And then the third floor of the academic wing. So we're gonna fly through a series of spaces here and Danielle is gonna moderate with some of Jonathan's uh, input as to how some of this supports those priorities that he established. And we'll start out with a, a fly around of the actual building to give you a sense from the exterior. So on the screen, on the top right hand corner there, that's the existing middle school. And you can see how they start to connect into the new building. And then this will translate to Do you want to fly around the exterior of the building first so you can see that relationship? So there's a, just to the right of that was the athletic entrance. And coming up on the main entrance, this is just a drop off area here. And just to start talking about the branding there, Upper Marion High School is etched into the window. And you see this a, lot of main, a, lot of, a lot of view we get into that Grain Commons area. Yeah, and a lot of natural light too. That was so important to us. So now you're seeing the, um, the steam areas. On the lower level, you'll see that there's overhead doors that open up into the courtyard. We'll show you more of that as we get into the plans. And we're coming around the ac academic wing here. And the, the materials and the colors are, are meant to complement the, the middle school because it really is meant to be a campus building, so. Again, a lot of natural light. This is the entry into the family consumer science um, at the lower level there. So we have a separate entrance into that space. That playground equipment that you see is also for that child development area that we have. Mm. And the road on the right-hand side is actually gonna be part of our um, parent drop-off queue that wraps around the back of the building get as much length as we possibly can to pull the traffic off of the neighborhood streets. Um, this is the amphitheater that you can see. It's gonna uh, open up into from the art is on the one side of the academic wing and our, our, um, our learning spaces are on the other side. This is coming around the auditorium spaces and music department. And then there's the entry into um, the athletic wing of the building. 
looking through the windows would be the pool and the natatorium. And then that connection to the middle school there. So Danielle, I'm just gonna, because it's having such a hard time running through these videos, yeah. um, I'm just gonna pass this one, but this is that exposed stream bed uh, with the amphitheater and the arts amphitheater built into it. So this is kind of an outdoor learning core. And Dave, just uh, let everybody know that that area has already been created and it, it's pretty amazing when you look at that right now without a building around it, it's incredible to see that th this vision is actually starting to take shape. So this is entering into the main entrance of the building and the video is just gonna go into the administrative area. Wanted to be warm and inviting. Uh, it also serves as a secured entrance vestibule. And it also opens up into the steam area, which, or not the steam area, the student commons area, which you'll see here shortly. But you can see the windows looking into that area there. So you have that transparency, not only to the outside, the visual transparency to the outside, but also inside as well. It's highlighted area there. We're gonna be going into the student commons area. Again, a really rich, warm space with the laminated beams above. Um, open to the, the library on the upper level there. It's gonna be a really dynamic space. Um, lower level has the cafeteria kitchen um, so that we can have food service during the day, but also open um, throughout the day. This space will be used before and after school activities. It is a central core of the building that has direct access to the auditorium and performing arts areas, the gymnasium straight ahead as well as the academic wing and the resource area upstairs, which is what we're viewing there now. Yeah, we're really excited about that just being the energy hub of the building with, with yep. access to athletics, access to the library, access to guidance, everything. Yeah. And a variety of different seating areas for various activities and the Kids can sit by themselves or get together with groups. This is the counseling center, again, off of that um, student commons area with offices around the perimeter, career in the center. We wanted to make sure that our counselors were accessible as well. That was important to the counselors. So you can see those offices, you know, they're not tucked back away down a hallway past the, past the receptionist where you can't see them or can't gain access. Uh, they're, they're very readily available uh, and uh, they can see you know, kids as they enter and, and kids can see them as they work. Uh, now we're going into the performing arts. One of the things that we really were striving for here is to make it a really intimate space. There's not, um, it's not a big, huge auditorium, but we tried to pull the seating close to the stage as much as possible. We do have an orchestra pit just in front of the stage there. But for those events where we want to have more seating capacity, you can see on the upper balcony, we have some additional tiered seating up there. That's actually retractable. It can get pushed back and then the flat floor, floor can be used for other activities like large group instruction activities. There's a dividing partition. It can be divided in two different spaces. So it just provides a lot of flexibility for the space that typically could only be used maybe five times a year. And that space is directly next to the library. So it's a, it's a natural large group instructional space attached to the library. Uh, moving on to the gymnasium, we did take um, our cue from Central York and did a elevated track around the perimeter of the gymnasium. Um, we have bleacher seating on three sides, which is a little unusual, but uh, we also have additional bleacher seating that again is retractable up at the mezzanine level. So for those events where we need a lot of capacity, we have that flexibility. And those far end bleachers, uh, they go directly from the, you know, court level up to the running track. So a kid doesn't have to leave the space uh, to go walk around the track if they're doing something instructionally or, or even uh, for an athletic practice. And 
and a bit of the branding with uh, Viking Nation on the floor and the Viking. Uh, this is an auditorium. Eight lane pool with a diving well, movable bulkhead. I think what's really interesting about this space is the, the laminated beams in this space as well. Again, it gives this really rich tone to the, the space and all the windows along the side brings natural light into the space. And as Dr. Toledo mentioned earlier, currently the district has two obsolete pools. So we're turning that into one, you know, fantastic pool that instructionally during the day will be used more by the middle school and it's attached right to their athletic area. And then after school, it'll be used more by the high school uh, in our, in our uh, extracurricular and athletic programs, as well as the community. Great use of space for everybody. Uh, going into the media center here on the upper tier, again, open to the student comms below. A really interactive space. Um, a lot of the technology areas are directly adjacent to it, like the TV studio. Um, a lot of what Jonathan talked about earlier and what he expects to happen in this, this media center, not just about stacks, but collaborative areas and a resource area for it's a hub of the school. I'm gonna keep humming through them here. Yeah. So directly adjacent to the media center in an offshoot of what we would consider a corridor uh, is this teaming space. And again, with technology, a variety of different uh, desks and tables and um, dry market boards and technology it can be used for individual activities. It has um, small group instructions around the perimeter, small, small group instructions around the perimeter. Um, this is gonna be a great space that feeds off of the media center and is just down the hallway from the academic wing. These are those student collaboration spaces that are just so sorely needed with the way that kids learn today. Yeah. Could be more excited about that area. And then if you were to continue down the hallway towards the academic wing, I thought this would be an opportunity to locate the locker banks in this area. We don't have them in the three-story academic wing. Uh, we have enough lockers for about 30% of the population for those that want to have a locker. Uh, we're seeing that high school students don't use lockers as much. Uh, but this bridge actually not only physically acts as a um, link between the public spaces and the, um, and the academic spaces, but metaphorically, it also serves as that physical separation between the two. And that, by the way, was one of Jonathan's original ideas. Yeah, I stole his thunder. <laughs> now we just picture, though, coming across that bridge, kids getting, picking up their materials and getting in the mindset of now I'm going to go do, make, and learn. Yeah, and this, this research, develop, and present is what we molded this whole three-story classroom wing around. You can see that vertical connection um, to all three floors with the learning stair. Um, students are gonna be using this as collaboration space, just a breakout space. Uh, and then you can see those glass walls around the perimeter. So we have that transparency between what we would consider a classroom, but really a space where um, instruction happens and then kids can come out and flow through this space um, for a variety of different activities we have tables around the perimeter of it for sit down locations. Um, it's gonna be a really neat space. There's just oh, yeah. the idea that, that, you know, I see you learn, you see me learn, we're all yeah. learning. Yeah. That's a learning community. We learn together. So the school is departmentalized, but it isn't by grade level. And you can see some of the branding there for world language with the flags. One of the things that were talked about um, with the students as we started to develop the plans here. 
this is looking at some of the resource areas as the technologies are concerned. Going into one of the classrooms. Again, a lot of natural light flooding in, flexible seating. And trying to develop that student-centered space, minimize square footage for teacher life. And so the rooms are really not personalized. It's more about the community, um, except for this area. This is more of the STEAM area, the tech ed area. Uh, we have a ramp going down so that we get more ceiling height in these areas. But it does, again, is open up to that center core of the uh, adjacent to the learning stairs. And not only is it open up to that area, but then we have that flow through going to the exterior. Um, I think it goes into that space. You can see that transparency, being able to see what's happening in the spaces, which is really cool. And you can see the overhead doors where they can start to take their projects outside. So there's an interaction of indoor outdoor spaces. Yeah, you know, the, the projects that kids do in those areas, you know, they sort of need to breathe. You need the space to, to really uh, dig into them. And I think uh, that it's going to be just, just immediate right there. So accessible. And just movement, movement around the building, movement in and out, moving through the spaces constantly interacting with people. In these areas, to me, they scream collaboration. You know, just, just a variety of different places for people to sit, be. And yep, and it'll draw them into the spaces, no doubt. And this is a lot that we saw at the Alexandria thing where the kids were interacting in these commons areas, breaking up into various groups, whether it was large groups or smaller groups. And you caught a glimpse of the teacher instructional planning space there that was sort of right in the middle of all that. Yeah. Again, connected. Um, this is part of family consumer science this is a child development area. Again, like we said, it had a um, exterior entrance so it could be, um, drop off and pick up throughout the day. So it's a fully functional you know, nursery school program. And so we have an instructional side to that space and then and the side for uh, the actual the nursery program to happen. And, and then this is the- This is a little slowly. I get the idea that was textiles and I know this is the culinary arts program. All part of that family consumer science hub. I'm uh, getting into the art area, I think. Then adjacent to the instructional planning centers, which are at the core of the um, academic wing, adjacent to the collaboration areas. And the great thing about having all those STEAM spaces you know, on the first floor, you know, kids really get a sense of, uh, this is where I get to, to dig in, design and, uh, and make. Just the science area. Yeah, that's the collaboration space outside some of our science classrooms. One of the things that we're gonna be doing is uh, display cases outside of some, a lot of these department areas so they can display their work or um, still have that visual connection with the classroom out into the collaboration area.
so the, uh, the videos, here we are talking about a major technology building and uh, the videos for whatever reason, it's broadcasting all over the United States here back and forth between uh, Rick's office and our uh, place is, is clearly a challenge. So that took about twice as long uh, to go through the videos as it could have. But the building's underway and we broke ground this summer, very proud moment, even during COVID. Uh, Dr. Tolino had a great group around him uh, with Jonathan, the entire school board uh, and all of the uh, local township officials and so on. Great experience and a great opportunity. And I guess um, for us, for a team like us who understands a lot of the 21st and 22nd century, I guess we have to start looking at thoughts in terms of uh, development for education. Uh, it's been such a great pleasure to work with the Upper Marion Area School District on something that is clearly going to set a standard for the next generation of high schools. So I'd just like to offer back to uh, Jonathan and Dr. Tolino, if you have any closing thoughts about this as we go forth, we have about two years worth of excitement as we watch the skeleton go up, the skin go on and the systems go in. Um, but eventually we'll all walk into this amazing new building. So do you guys have any closing thoughts? Sure. Um, working with uh, the Schrader group, this is going to sound like a sales pitch and it, it, it really needs to come across more as uh, just being so thankful and so lucky that we've been able to work with your group because you made this, all three of the projects that we've now done together, just seamless um, from design uh, through development, through actual construction. And, and this, is, this is truly going to be a showpiece, just the way I feel about our elementary schools that we created and have been having open now for several years. This high school is going to be state of the art. It's gonna be something that we're gonna be so proud of to have our students and our staff members working and learning in side by side collaboratively because you've taken on the, this team has taken all of the, the essence of everything we wanted to do and design it into a building. And we're so thankful that our community and our board members uh, supported everything that we've done. So we're very, very fortunate as a district and we look forward to uh, seeing the end of the, the, this project completed. Clearly it's a, it's a great process right now, but we know that our community is gonna certainly benefit once the project is open. Thank you. Yeah, well said, Dr. Tolino. I'll just echo the fact that this whole process has, has been amazing. Each of us are just caretakers for education in Upper Marion when we're, you know, employees uh, and administrators, and we try and lead into the future. And uh, I don't think there's anything that I've done in my career that's been more important uh, in the long term to the community than the design of, of this building. So I just can't wait to, to open it up and, uh, and to, to use it. These folks have made true centers for the community. We can't wait to see this one come to fruition. And uh, these students have nothing but great things ahead of them, both because of the facilities and because of the people who are educating them. So thank you, everybody. We truly appreciate being able to share this project. Thanks.